Hi there, it's Mike Langford. Welcome to the Advisor Financing Forum, a podcast presented by Skyview Partners. This week on the show, Aaron Hassler and I are joined by Dave Hinnenkamp, CEO of Bergen KDV, a comprehensive business, financial, and technology solutions provider that does a little bit of everything to help your business with whatever it needs most. If you swing by bergenkdv.com slash about and watch their do more video, not only will you learn a bit more about what they do, you'll get your money's worth in entertainment value as well. I promise, really great video. We asked Dave to come on the show because of his unique perspective on the proposed changes to the federal capital gains tax rate and how it might affect the climate for RIA mergers and acquisitions. Make sure you have your notes app handy because Dave is dropping some serious knowledge bombs in this episode. And if you find yourself inspired or curious to learn more about the best path forward for buying or selling an RIA or independent financial advisory business during a rapidly changing landscape, please feel free to reach out to the team at Skyview by swinging by skyview.com or if you're feeling old school, pick up the phone and give them a ring at 866-567-6282. Lastly, before we get rolling with our conversation, please make sure you subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or YouTube if you're feeling fancy and want to see how amazing my man Aaron looks now that he's got himself a haircut and he's uh, out of the bunker and in the Skyview office. You're going to want to check that out. And if you have questions or suggestions for guests or topics for the show, please shoot us a note at podcast at skyview.com or hit us up on the socials. Skyview is active on LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. We would love to hear from you. Okay, let's get to our conversation with Dave Hinnenkamp. Well, Dave Hinnenkamp, Aaron Hassler. So awesome to see you, gents. I didn't know we're supposed to coordinate the, the color blue. I'm a little darker blue. You can't tell. It almost looks black here. But uh, welcome to the show. It's great to have both of you. Great to be here. I can't speak for you two, but I look good. (laughs) This is true. You do look well for, for those who are tuning in, I've seen you before, Aaron, two things are noticeably different about you. Number one, uh, your background looks a little different. You were no longer in the, the Hassler bunker. Uh, you're, you're in the Skyview offices, which is awesome. You also Look like you've got a haircut and are not wearing a baseball hat for the first time, I think, ever on one of these shows. It, it feels good. I must say, you know, you know, everybody's kind of survived the pandemic in their different ways, but it is nice to be back in the office and start to feel like we're getting back to normal. And um, <laughs> I'm, I'm looking forward to this. Yeah. And actually, when you when you think about it, uh, when we see ourselves on, on video, we uh, we haven't done that for a long time. The pandemic brought that about. Right. So, yeah. I look at it from myself. I look at you two and you're much younger than I am, but I've got a delusional mirror in my house here. So when I look into that delusional mirror, I see someone that's 25 years old and I look like I did back then. So <laughs> I look great too. You know, so great to be on the show. Oh, great. Yeah, yeah, it's great. Yeah, it's Welcome. so funny. You ever see that Seinfeld episode with the the, the, the the skinny mirror episode where they talk about, you know, I think Elaine goes <laughs> and she tries on some clothes and then she gets home and she thinks it's terrible. She's like, oh, skinny mirror, like in the dressing room. It made me look amazing. I get this home and I look terrible. <laughs> I did. I love the Seinfeld series. <laughs> That's wonderful. That's wonderful. Well, Dave, I'm so thrilled to have you on the show because I, you know, the, the stuff we're going to be chatting about today, capital gains tax stuff you know at the high level i know a lot of people like oh this is super nerdy but it's it's really important and i can geek out on it in a fun way i think and i think the two of you will as well there there, there's so much interesting stuff here and a lot of it will have an impact on advisors right that are that are considering entering a transaction so whether they're they're on the seller or the buyer side this this is going to come into play so i thought a great way to start start us off might be with some of the fundamentals on capital gains tax to to ensure that everyone is kind of on the same page here. So why is the tax rate on capital gains different than the taxes we, we, we see on ordinary income? What's kind of like the origin story there, if you will? Yeah, that's a great question, Mike. I, going way back, the, the whole idea behind having a, a favorable tax rate on capital gains, and let me say first, for, throughout this show, when we talk about capital gains, we're going to talk about long-term capital gains held more than a year, as opposed to short-term capital gains held less than a year, because short-term gains is 
most I believe know are taxed at whatever the ordinary rates are. So long-term capital gains, or we'll just call it capital gains, have had favorable treatment over time simply because it was a great way to incent people to take risk, to invest. So if I have a choice in buying a bond or investing in some company that might go out of business, obviously I, I want a greater return on that other investment, on the one that I've got more risk with. So having favorable capital gains rates was a way to ensure that people would take those risks. So it was an incentive to take those risks. It makes sense, right? So, it makes sense. We, and we think about that you know, as, as a business owner, right? You, you know, like I want to keep investing in a business and if I sell my business, I want to take that, what I've gained from that business and maybe invest it in another business, right? So it's if I reduce my ability to invest, I can't buy another business and I can't hire more people, right? Um, yeah, so it really it Right, and if, if, the, if the tax rate gets too high, then people won't won't sell those businesses and make the next investment, right? They might just sit on that business. Mm-hmm. So there have been incentives over the years to to get people to take to take risks. And that's really what has driven the American economy for many, many years, small business. Yeah, yeah, it makes sense. And has that capital gains rate, Dave, always been lower than the regular income rate historically? With the exception of three years. 1988, 1989, and 1990, and I might be off by a year or so, but in those years, the capital gains rate was the same as the top ordinary rate at 28%. And that was the only the only time period. So it was a very brief time period in history. So when you look at the capital gains rate, if you go way back, there's always been a difference between, almost up with the exception of those three years, there's always been a difference between the capital gains rate and the ordinary income rate. So if we just take a couple of, of spot checks, if you will. So 1954, the capital gains rate was 25%, but the ordinary, the, the top marginal ordinary income rate was, income tax rate was 91%. So a huge spread in that. And let's fast forward to 1977. At that time, it was actually the highest capital gains rate was just under 40%, 39.875. And the reason I put 0.875 is the proposal now is 39.6, right? But we'll talk about in a little bit that it it might actually be a little bit higher than that. But in 1977, the top marginal tax on ordinary income was 70%. So there's always been a spread with the exception of those three years. And keep in mind when it was those three years when there was no difference, both rates were relatively low, right? So there is, within history, there's always been an incentive to invest capital and thereby getting a lower tax rate on the gains relating to that. Makes sense, makes sense. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about the, the proposed trade changes, excuse me, I almost said proposed trades. Proposed, maybe trades is gonna be a part of this, but yeah, uh, the, the proposed changes, right? There, there are some changes to the capital gains tax and and the the Biden administration's tax plan that advisors may have heard about uh, in the news. So let's let's shed some light on what's happening there. At at a high level, what's your understanding of the outline of the proposed changes? You you mentioned that there's a potentially much higher rate uh, that's there. The one most people hear about in the news is simply that if you quote, make over a million dollars, your capital gains rate is going to go to 39.6%, the top proposed marginal rate for ordinary income. There is, in addition to that, there is something called the net investment income tax, the so-called Medicare tax. It was enacted a number of years ago that adds 3.8% to that. So effectively, the federal rate would be at 43.4%. For those, quote, again, making over a million dollars. Now, that that terminology, especially if you have a tax tax background, drives you absolutely crazy because what does it mean to make more than a million dollars? Does that mean does that mean your your gross income is over a million? Does that mean your taxable income is over a million? It's almost as vague as pay your fair share, right? So yeah. Yeah. so when I think when I think about that, there's so many things that come into play when we think about it, and and let's think about. Think about it in terms of someone selling a business as an example. The question is, over if you make over a million dollars, the rate is 39.6 plus 3.8% net investment tax, income tax, or 43.4%. What 
what they don't provide you is information about, okay, well, exactly what does that mean? So the first question you would have is, should or would the gain itself on the sale be used in determining whether you made a million dollars or not? Or is it everything excluding that? Mm. Should part of the gain be excluded? They don't, they don't talk about that. And then here's really the biggest thing. The biggest thing is this. If you think, well, why are they doing this? What they're really trying to do is they're trying to capture tax on passive investors who have huge gains right. because they deem them to be, quote, wealthy. Mm -hmm. So your typical investor that buys a stock or whatever it may be. Unfortunately, whenever you have tax policy, there are unintended consequences. And I think one of the unintended consequences here is the fact that you have business owners that have worked their lifetime building a business, and now they're in a position to sell, and it could be perhaps one of the most inopportune times to sell, right? So the, the real right. question I, I think is this, should an owner who is active in the business be treated differently from someone who is merely a passive investor? Stated another way, should the rate hike only apply to taxpayers who report investment income relative to that gain on sale and not to taxpayers who report business income relative to the gain on sale? I think those things are going to be clarified yet as we move forward, because my belief is that it was not intended to capture the business owner who has built a business over their lifetime and now is in a position to do a once in a lifetime sale that is intended to support them for the rest of their lives, what they've worked their entire life for. So there's a lot that's going to be coming out yet. And I, and I think we're just, we're just hearing what's on the surface. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the opening salvo, if you will, to negotiation. Uh, even if it's negotiate, negotiating not across the aisle, but within the, the Democratic Party itself, which, which right now controls, you know, but narrowly, but controls the, the Senate and the House and the Senate. You know, it's really interesting. So, you know, obviously we're not a political punditry uh, show here, <laughs> but but th there's some interesting elements to it. I'm always reminded of the quote from Michael Jordan years ago when people were giving him a little bit of a hard time because he wasn't more politically active on certain things. And he said, listen, Republicans buy shoes too. And he sells sneakers, mm -hmm. right? It was this his big things. Yeah, I remember and that. When, when, I, when I think about this issue specifically, the, the way we were just talking about it, it's like, listen, Democrats own, own businesses too, right? Like there's lots of people and, and they're not, to your point, some of them have had family businesses uh, and invested 30 years of their life building that business. And they, they're they're like, wait a minute, you can tell me that like when I sell this business, I'm about to get, you know, just a much, much higher tax rate than I would have, you know, when, when the previous administration was in place. Like, let's pump the brakes a little bit here. So I, I, I could definitely see there, there being, to your point, maybe some clarifying in there. What have you heard? I mean, so you're obviously, you've got your ear to the ground when it comes to this types of discussion because it, you know, it's, it's your biz. What, what are you hearing? Are you hearing that there's a lot of conversations about that, like looking for clarification on these issues? I, I don't believe there is support even I don't believe there's support in the Senate right now for a 39.6 rate or 43.4 percent rate. There are a couple of senators, Senator Menendez from New Jersey, who comes from a state with a lot of wealthy people and business owners who has cons constituents that he is representing. Uh, he has already sp spoken and said, I, I could support a higher rate, but not not at that rate, not at 39.6. Senator Mnuchin from West Virginia was is another one. So I think it's going to be really difficult. Even the House, the House is a it's a, it's a fairly narrow margin, but I think it has a better chance of passing the House than it does the Senate. I think the Senate is going to be very difficult. The only way they'd get it passed is to go along party lines and have uh, Vice President Harris you know, be the, cast the tie breaking vote. I don't believe that you're going to have all Democratic senators say yay to a 39.6 percent rate. That's that's my speculation. So my thought is to sit back and pay attention to it. Uh, it is likely that we're going to see an increase in the capital gains rate. Yeah, it is unlikely that it's going to be as high as what Biden proposed. That would be my you know 30,000 foot view, if you will. Do you think 
Because capital, you made the, the, the really important distinction there of capital gains rate is kind of a blunt instrument, right? Uh, if you will, because it's treating, uh, if I bought, you know, shares in a, a company, you know, just, and, and I traded them, you know, two years from now, and, and that treats that capital gain the same as if I sold my business, right? It's, it, so it's, it's, that's a blunt instrument, right? It's, it's not taking into account, like there, we talked about the incentive why, why would we want to have a lower capital gains rate than ordinary income rate? It's because what well, we want to incentivize capital going to work to, to do things, to, to build new businesses, to, to go for extra opportunities that, you know, as an example, green energy is really important, right, for, for, the, for the future, right? So you might want to encourage somebody to sell one business and then start building green energy businesses and so forth. So uh, have you got any indication that there may be the appetite to, Hey, capital gains rate on, you know, stock sales, right? A passive income, a pa passive investment are going to be higher than, again, to those who are, you're active in the business. You know, I, I, right now they're, they're not talking about it specifically. They're inkling along those lines. Uh, I, I believe that that conversation is going to come up because when you think about it, you, you can invest in a stock at, at any age, right? You can be 80 years old and buy a stock and decide whether you want to hang on to it. And to, to your point, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a totally discretionary event, right? You don't, you don't need to, you don't need to pay capital gains taxes. All you do is you just simply don't sell that asset. However, if you're a business owner, it's completely different because you get to a point in time where for whatever reason you might have for family and personal reasons, it might be health. It might be, Hey, you're, you're, you're burned out. You don't have the purpose and drive that you once had. And, you know, as I've gotten older, I'll, I'll, I will tell you, I, I don't have the same energy level. I can't sustain the same energy level that I was when I was in my twenties and thirties. No matter and what that mirror says in your house, no matter what. Exactly. <laughs> and why I, I okay, let's, let's be clear. I look the same. <laughs> That's right. That's right. I, don't have, I don't have the same energy level. So so I think it's incredibly important that that distinction be made yeah. because in my mind, there is a huge difference between the passive investor and capital gains that they, uh, they, that, that come about as a result of passive investing and someone who's active in the business. And, um, and when you look at, especially at advisors service type business, most of it is capital gain because you usually are not selling a lot of hard assets. Yeah. So, um, so I think it's an important distinction that has to be discussed. And I believe as time passes, it will be discussed. Now, history has shown that sometimes they pass a law only to find out a year or two later after getting a lot of, 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 of pushback that, hey, you know what, we need to make a technical correction. So, uh, <laughs> so sometimes, okay. yeah. So sometimes those errors, errors uh, or, hey, we didn't think of this, are corrected and usually relatively quickly. Aaron, let, I want to get your take on what you're seeing and hearing from the advisor population, right? I mean, so Skyview's in the business of facilitating mergers and acquisitions in the advisor space, right? So, you know, some advisors are considering selling, right? And, and like, yeah, this is a great time for me to start considering the exit of the business. Are you hearing advisors say, hey, What's the deal? Uh, should I move quicker? A tremendous amount of uh, interest questions about it, right? I, I would say for most advisors, between their own businesses themselves and the the clients they work with, this is their number one question. And I think you know advisors are always accustomed to being the source for answers, and so to have something that's pending like this is is kind of a stress point, right? And you know, as Dave was kind of alluding to, a, a lot of advisors have started these businesses from scratch. So it's not like they have a, a large cost basis. The cost basis on these is typically zero, right? Mm -hmm. uh, because they built this business up uh, one client at a time. So we're seeing a tremendous amount of stress and interest on it. Um, advisors wanting to speed up their timetable, you know, some as early as September or for sure by the end of the year. And, um, you know, it's an interesting kind of conversation to have. Um, I can understand it's stressful though, as you're dealing with, like you said, it's, you know, the challenge we have is that it, you have advisors that have spent 30, 40 years building up a business. And you always knew in the wealth management industry that 
you know, say the market might be a risk or tax changes could possibly um, affect a sale. And we're working, you know, on some ideas on how to mitigate this and, and hearing Dave's expertise is awesome, but it's certainly a big stress and concern for our clients. Yeah, I can, I can, I can imagine so. Cause I'm sitting there thinking to myself, if I'm 65 years old and I've been thinking about selling this business or a chunk of the business, cause I, yeah, I know that a lot of the, the, advisors don't sell a hundred percent, uh, when they're, when they're, 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 you know, maybe just gonna sell half the business and bring on a new partner or whatever. This could give you some pause or, or give you like a, cause you know, I read something, I was you know, doing a little research for this episode and kind of just going through like, let me bone up on my capital gains tax nerdery. So I don't sound like an idiot on this, but <laughs> so there was one quote that I thought was so, um, apt, I guess is the right phrase. It, it, it was, you know, capital gains is a discretionary event, right? You make a decision to sell, right? So, you know, income, ordinary income is like, I'm making money. I have to live. I'm out there, you know, I've got a job or I'm paying myself a salary for my business. I am earning income, but I guess that's discretionary too. You could be lazy and not make money, but, uh, <laughs> you know, but like, it is really interesting. So there, there's a, this, there's a decision that has to be made on the behalf of, of the advisor and the RAA ownership to, to sell or to not sell uh, the business. So this could absolutely uh, have an impact, I imagine. Uh, yeah, I think the thing we struggle with a little bit too is for a lot of advisors, it's the right decision to sell, right? At the end of the day, you know, what they're looking at is it's continuity for your clients, it's better care. It's often allows for the business to grow faster when you incorporate more people. And, and add more services. So it's a conflicting process here as, as you're, you're saying to people, hey, this is the right time to sell. So when you have the energy and your ability to transition your clients, you know, tomorrow's never guaranteed. And in a relationship-based business, we want to help people secure that work. And so to have, you know, a, a pending tax changes like this come in is, you know, add some stress to a already emotional conversation for a lot of advisors. You made the, the point, you know, you started talking about like, you know, sell when you have still have the energy, you're still running the business, you don't want to let that decay. Like there's some risks, right, to holding on. I mean, if you're sitting there going, well, tax rates may go up, you know, from you know, in the 20s to 40, right? So it might, might be freaking you out that you might have to pay all this extra money in, in capital gains tax in your brain. But there is some risk to saying, yeah, well, that's it. I'm not selling. I'm just going to stick with this business, right? Like the business could decay, right, Aaron? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think at the end of the day, these these businesses always have strong relationships and the revenue is consistent. But to Dave's point, you know, we all look beautiful on this call, but at the end of the day, our energy level probably isn't what it was 10, 20 years ago. I know in our house with a, a, a baby uh, in the house, it, it ages you rapidly. <laughs> There's a lot of wear and tear there that's happening for me. But, um, you know, I think that, what we see is there are all these other factors for clients. It's, it's client attrition through death. It's for older advisors not connecting with the inheriting generation and wanting to bring team members in to help fill that gap. You know, and it's just the idea that at the end of the day, you know, we, we see it all the time. We get calls from advisors that, yeah, they might get a bad diagnosis or a health event that really has an eye-opening experience for them. Um, maybe a pandemic, you know, I don't know if anybody's ever experienced a pandemic before, but sometimes that can cause external pressure. And so we always are in the business of encouraging people to, you know, plan early, plan often, which is the advice advisors give their clients. And then have these scenarios where you can have several contingency options. But, you know, I guess I've always been somebody that's probably purchased insurance and and looked at what are my protection mechanisms in place so that I can ensure my business lives on, my clients are taken care of. And, and that's the conversation we're having today. And it's yeah. always interesting. Aaron, I think that's, I think that's spot on. And, and through the many years that I've advised clients on, on their businesses, what I've always stressed is look at the economic reasons for why you're, you're doing what you want to do, not, the tax reason. So the unfortunate part about this tax conversation that's that's in place now because of because of uh, Biden wanting to raise the capital gains rate is, is people are looking at that and saying, "Hey, should I sell?" What I always say is, don't 
don't make taxes the number one reason you buy or sell anything. That should be that should be a secondary or perhaps even a tertiary concern. Look first at, hey, what is my plan? And for many years, I've asked clients, well, what are, what are your plans? Oh, I plan to retire in five years. And I had a colleague once that said, well, you know why they say five years, don't you? And I said, well, I, I guess I haven't thought about it. Well, you know, it's a, it's short enough to be believable, but it's long enough that I don't have to do anything today. So, <laughs> and I thought that was really intuitive. The, the point being, hey, have a, have a plan, whatever that is. It might be because of age. It might be because of burnout. It might be, be because of health and not that you plan that necessarily, but there are so many other reasons to sell your business or to start having the, that discussion. And then the tech side in, in my mind is at best secondary. And in today's environment, what I would look at and say is, hey, if you plan to sell within the next year and maybe even next two years, well, yes, maybe you do consider, uh, hey, should I do that a little bit earlier? Mm. But if your plan was to, to wait a few years, I, th that's okay. But at the same time, I wouldn't, it, let's, say, let's say capital gains rates did go up. I wouldn't say, well, now I'm going to hang on until they go back down. I wouldn't do that either because yeah. there are other factors that determine the price of the business. I mean, if you look at it right now, I think valuations are relatively high. Yeah. Uh, you've got lots of dollars chasing the deals. Secondarily, I think uh, the, the, the asset levels are high because the market's been relatively high. And then there's this. Yeah, exactly. Thanks, Aaron. I forgot about that part. And then look, if you look at the capital and special purpose acquisition corps, I mean, they're the, these SPACs that you hear about. There's so many dollars out there. I want to I want to believe in 2020 it was a it was over 80 billion dollars that was raised, which was mm -hmm. six times greater than the year before, which was another record. So there's so much capital. And by the way, they have to get that. They have to use that or, or put that to work within two years. Mm -hmm. But SPACs can go public in about uh, two months versus about six months if I want to take a, a company public. So what they've done is they've they take these SPACs public and then they go buy the company and rather than taking the company public itself. So there's so much money out there that I think valuations are high. So you know what? So what if I pay a little bit higher tax higher tax rate in a future year? If my valuation is so much higher, my net might still be higher. Mm. So don't ignore taxes, but don't make that the driving reasons why you you enter into a transaction. I don't know if that makes sense. 100% makes sense. I mean, you know, Warren Buffett often talks about that. He's like, you know, there was you know, lots of wealth created when those tax rates were at that astronomical level you were talking about, you know, the 70 you know, to 90% you know, ordinary you know, top marginal rate. There were still people becoming millionaires back then, right? So taxes, a friend of mine always said, you know, I always wish I could have a tax problem, right? Because that means I made a lot of money, <laughs> you know? And it's, it's true. It's like usually, now I get it. Like if you're an advisor and you're like, hey, listen, man, I've been thinking about selling this business for a, you know, a little while. This is my plan. And now the tax rates are going to go up. But the point that you just made, Dave, I think is so apt is like, look, valuations have been going up access to capital for business acquisitions through Skyview is available where it wasn't only a few short years ago, right? You, you, you would have had to own or finance this deal. And now it's like somebody can come along and borrow the money at historically low rates and, and buy your business. And in my mind, I'm thinking, well, we already know that there's a lot, there's a lot more buyers out there than there are sellers. So, you know, just like in my neighborhood, there's almost no inventory on houses. And so I'm seeing some ridiculous prices in my neighborhood. Like, did somebody really just pay a million dollars for that house that I know sold for like 600 grand only a few years ago? Like, hmm, it's interesting. <laughs> anyway, uh, so uh, I think the same thing is likely to happen with businesses. Are, are you seeing that too, Aaron? Are you, are you, are you, are you, have you been seeing like kind of valuations creep up uh, lately? Yeah, that's a great question. It's, I've had a couple. Yes. I mean, the short answer is people ask that all the time. And I have kind of two answers for them. And then usually it's a, it's depends because to some extent, valuations are, are going up, but we also are entering into an era of bank financing that hasn't been available before. Mm. And part of the reason that valuations were what they were, you know, even three, four, you know, four or five years ago, was because there wasn't a way to finance these. It was really all seller financing. And so, you know, what we're kind of 
you know, it's been interesting to see during this pandemic is how much businesses have evolved and adapted. And there have been all of these talks about fee compression in our industry and the idea that, you know, advisors are going to be working harder for every dollar. And, but what's been also happening is that as technology has gotten better, especially the tools in our industry, which really hadn't been invested in until about maybe six, eight years ago, is advisors can do so much more with their time. So they're providing these services anyway. We've seen some of that, that threat of fee compression not actually be realized. And then we're bringing in bank financing. So, you know, I would argue that valuations are probably coming up to an appropriate level. And I hope to see that they maintain because the, uh, the onset of bank financing. But it does help that, like you said, you know, the, the market has been on a long, you know, a long great run here. So I think it's all of these factors involved. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a that's a great point, Aaron. And you you pointed that out to me in a previous conversation. The when you think about the bank financing side of it, you're absolutely right. It was very difficult in the past to to get debt on an intangible asset, right? When you went to a bank, you know, you could you could more easily buy borrow money uh, borrow money on a, a lamp to buy a Lamborghini than you could to buy an investment bank or investment business, right? Because they had right. this hard asset that that, that had right. some value, even if it was depreciating. And if you look at the investment business, and you were the one that pointed out this this to me, and it's intu it's intuitive and obvious, but unless you think about it, it's it 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 doesn't it's not obvious to you so which is you have an asset that is increasing in value because over time market returns are increasing the value of that asset and and i think that's uh that's an incredible point and to your point access to capital through bank financing and i know skyview has been active in in helping with that that's that's another key point and you're right uh, values are high relative to the past but are they high relative to what they should be? And I think your answer to that was, no, I think they're coming up to where they should have been. Yeah. And I think, you know, it's interesting. One is you can't wrap a wealth management business around a tree by driving too fast. Um, I, I suppose you could do other things to it, but <laughs> then you can't wrap it around a tree. But we always laugh because when we're explaining, you know, cash flow lending and, and financing wealth management businesses, banks love tangible assets. And you know, as we've proven through this pandemic is that all businesses of so many varieties have found new ways to create revenue and or adjust and maintain their revenue. And that's what I think has been uh, absolutely fascinating. And I, I can't wait to, you know, five, six years from now, start to read some of the books that, you know, or articles that will come out about how all of these businesses have adapted and adjusted. But I mean, here we are doing a, a webinar and a conversation on Zoom I've talked with Dave now, what, three times? We've never met in person. And yet I can see his face, you know, at a moment's notice, assuming I can log on properly. <laughs> you know, so it's really created an opportunity for advisors to expand their business. And, and that's what I really like about not just our industry, but I'm sure many industries, is we've created new ways to sell a portion of the business or create a succession plan and then phase out over three or four years as opposed to, you know, doing an immediate sale. But I think we can get creative just like we've gotten creative in this pandemic. Very interesting. So one of the things that came up in our prep call that kind of just logically jumps to mind here is if capital gains are something that are of significant concern to an advisor and they're like, they're, they're kind of feeling like they might want to hold on to the business a little longer, right? Uh, kind of stay there. What are some alternative options that might not trigger capital gains, but it will allow the advisor to kind of begin to exit the business or, or start to take some of that money off the table and, and kind of begin their glide path, as the Skyview team calls it? Yeah, I think... Uh... When, when I look at the options that are available out there, and of course, we have to wait until we see what the final tax bill looks like. But let's assume for a minute that capital gains, higher capital gains rates kicked in at a million bucks, right? Uh, at that point in time, what you could do is you could you could sell on an, an installment sale and, and make sure, work with your CPA and, 
make sure that you keep the the income below that million dollar threshold. And oh, another thing they haven't clarified is if you go over a million dollars, is it only the portion above a million that's taxed at the higher rate or everything once you hit that? In other words, is it a, is it a cliff? Mm-hmm. My presumption is that only amount above a million. So in other words, work to keep the income down as much as possible by doing an installment sale. And again, depends upon the size of your business. Now, unfortunately, what that does is it forces you to keep to retain some risk right? Mm. Because to the extent you haven't collected the cash, you're still on the hook for it. So again, I'll go back and say, hey, look at the economic conditions first before you make a decision based totally on tax. But uh, one thing you could certainly do is to, uh, yeah, sell it over time and sell on the installment method. You get to defer that over a period of a period of time for for a vast majority of the gain that you have, which for advisors being it's 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 largely goodwill customer list those you would be able to defer on certain certain assets you have to recognize immediately but that really not worth a lot of time on a discussion for the advisory type business well aaron you know you talk about this all the time though that that it's it's becoming and we actually mentioned it earlier in the show that it's becoming increasingly common for advisors to do a partial sale right that they're, they're not going hey i'm selling the whole business Good luck, next generation of advisors. I'm out going fishing, right? It's 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 more likely that they sell 25% of the business and bring on a new partner and then and then gradually uh, again glide out over years. And then so I'm 65 now, but I'm gonna be completely out by the time I'm 75. Uh, but I'm not selling it all at once, right? You know, I mean it's it is interesting. I, the wealth management industry has always been um I don't know, a lo- uh, almost a lone wolf industry, right? We, we, a lot of these founders got in and and started businesses as individual entrepreneurs, right? And didn't take on business partners and then grew large enterprises and hired people. And so the idea of partnerships and mergers for a lot of older advisors is challenging. It's some, something that they're not necessarily accustomed to. But what's interesting is through proper guidance, you know, here at Skyview, we have a business partnership. We have many people that have created the company of what it is today. And so what we're finding is that with a little bit of, of work and ingenuity, advisors can create partnerships, but then we, we can cheat a little bit too, which is that we can use bank financing to our advantage. And you know, one of the things that Skyview has really worked hard at is creating 100% financing or liquidity for that business owner. But then you can use the resources the bank has, which is escrow accounts, you know, putting some money into trust. You know, Dave mentioned the installment sale. So what we've been able to do is say, okay, maybe you can finance 100% of that business today, but then create an installment structure to keep below, say, that you know, million dollar income threshold. So I think in working with, you know, all professionals in this industry, we can come up with some really creative ideas. I love it. I love it. So one, you started to dip your toes into this a little bit, Dave. And for those of us who are, you know, again, novices at this concept of, of capital gains as it relates to an advisory business, maybe you can share a little bit about how that's calculated, right? Because in the traditional sense, capital gains is, hey, you bought something at one price. If it's if it is a, a business or, or an asset and you made some improvements to it, you get to put that into the, the capital capitalization of that. And when you sell it, whatever you sell it for minus what you bought it for and improve the improvements you made, that's your capital gain, right? When we look at an advisory business, because there's no assets there, is it really all capital gain? Like you started this business from zero, you grew it, like, congratulations, you have a hundred percent capital gain or, or are there other components to it? I think you, I think you nailed it from that perspective, Mike. So when you, if we run through a very very simple example of let's let's take a let's take a piece of equipment. I buy a piece of equipment for hundred thousand dollars. I depreciate that piece of equipment, and when the depreci- depreciated value is fifty thousand, lo and behold, for some reason it appreciated in value. I'm able to sell it for one hundred ten thousand. Okay, so my gain at that point in time is one hundred ten thousand minus my it's called tax basis or fifty thousand because okay. I depreciated it down to that. Right. So my total gain is 60, all right? 
of that sixty thousand dollar gain, fifty thousand dollars is due because of the previous depreciation that you took. Yep. That is calculated or taxed at a different rate than the additional ten that you got above and beyond what you paid for it. The capital gain is that ten thousand. The fifty thousand is called recapture, which is a rate between capital gains and ordinary income. Now we're really digging into the weeds and really geeking out, right? Right. Uh, when you now, but now let's look at an advi advisory business. But for maybe a few computers and things of that nature, a vast majority, like Aaron Aaron had mentioned, is it's people starting a business from virtually nothing, growing it over time. And really what they've created is a customer list and an income stream that suddenly has a lot of value to the marketplace. So what is your tax basis in that? Well, likely nothing because all of the expenses that you incurred in building that you wrote off each year as you ran your business. So your tax basis is zero. So if your tax basis is zero, when you sell that asset, it is all 100% capital gain if you held it for more than a year, which I don't know, I guess I'd uh, if I could grow a, a $30 million business in 12 or uh, in nine months, I'd take the short-term gains and pay it and, <laughs> and say, thank you very much. Yeah. But in all, in all of these cases, obviously, it's a lifetime of labor and love, right? Mm -hmm. And you've built a business and it will largely be all capital gains subject to the capital gains rates. And what I mentioned earlier is I think there's a huge distinction between generating a capital gain in that manner versus, hey, I passively bought an investment and it increased in value because I held it a long time. So um, that's that's the real basics of, of how capital gains are calculated for the advisory business. And I said, like I said, there are some exceptions to that if you have some hard assets, but it's relatively inconsequential to the to the whole deal. Fascinating. So yeah, and per your comment earlier though, Dave, too, I think in, in looking at the glasses half full approaches that the benefit of even though there's not a lot you can depreciate on these investment advisory businesses, I think the advantage is for the most part, I know compared to a lot of other industries, the margins are higher. Mm. And so that's been the benefit is you don't have a huge infrastructure that you've got to go hire and you can service and charge a good rate with relatively strong margins, which is how we've been able to prove that these businesses have value, have transferable value and are bankable because of that margin. So it, it can it can benefit in a number of ways. Yeah. Yeah. And I can I can confirm that. So at, at Bergen KDB, we've got a number of different businesses, but if I look at the CPA business, the technology business and the wealth business business, and I just look at those three, the well, both the growth gross margin and the net margin is higher for the wealth management side. Now that doesn't mean the other businesses aren't valuable. Of course they are, but the margins are higher there. But there's also more volatility because the 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 price will change as the income changes as well with changes in the market. So uh, it's what you stated is absolutely right, Aaron. Very, very smart. Well, as we're thinking about wrapping this up here, I imagine advisors listening to this are like, oh, I have some questions. I want to start digging into this. And I would I would encourage the the advisors who are starting to think about, you know, buying or selling a business to dive into this topic a little bit deeper and talk to a CPA who knows this space really well, such as yourself, Dave. Uh, how how should an advisor work with their CPA firm uh, in a rapidly changing environment like the one we're in? to make sure they're, they're, they're prepared and, 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 and ready to either as a seller or, or a buyer to, to move in, in the right direction. Yeah. And I think it would go beyond the CPA, Mike. I think uh, it, when you look at, when you look at Skyview, for example, if you're in the business of helping companies sell a business, I, I think the key, whether it's CPA or, or the whole team, there has to be great communication. So let's, let's be talking to, our client about, hey, what is it that you want to accomplish? What is your timeline? And then as a team, how can we structure it to maximize not only what we make, but what we keep? And uh, I, I, I always tell the story about what, what caused me to think about, hey, we should start a wealth management business. And, and it was going back to my days of tax planning where 
I would do some tax planning for a client and at the end of the year, after the end of the year, I would get all the information. And here, unbeknownst to me, a, a broker would do a transaction that blew up my tax planning. It wasn't the, it wasn't the broker advisor's fault. They, they're not tax experts. And I didn't think, hey, maybe I should call the broker and have a conversation, but the, the broker didn't either, right? So the key there is you've got to have communication that takes place. And it's so easy in today's world to communicate. Look what we're doing now, right? It's easy to connect with someone. So putting together that team, and it's not just the CPA and the client, it's also it's also the advisor. So Aaron, with Skyview, when you're working, you want a team of advisors. That's, that's how we go about doing it. So communication is the key and all parties understanding, understanding what it is their role is in that process. And then keeping the client at the center of the conversation, making sure we accomplish what the client wants to, wants to accomplish. I think those are the keys to, to making it work. Fantastic. And Aaron, I would assume similar, similar advice on your end, right? So as, as advisors or, or uh, this is rattling around in their head, how does this impact me? How does this impact me? It's probably a smart idea for them to reach out to you and the Skyview team to talk a little bit about this to, you know, walk it through. You bet you've actually navigated these waters quite a few times with advisors. And it's a relatively new concept, right? So yeah. the fact that advisors don't know this in detail is understandable. And to Dave's point, and you know, the old commercial was, if you stayed at a Holiday Inn Express, you'd somehow have greater knowledge. I think I could stay at a Holiday Inn Express every night and I wouldn't even get remotely close to Dave's knowledge about taxes. <laughs> but I, I, what, what we enjoy at is getting on with all of the different experts and learning all this stuff. I mean, this has been a fun conversation, fascinating to, to hear Dave's perspective and guidance on this. And so we do this all the time with clients, which is get on the phone with their CPA, get on the phone with their legal team, talk through ideas. And we love to, as we're going through these bank financing deals, is we love to hear about the deal structures and have insight from other advisors on how they've structured things, how they've merged partnerships. It really gives us a window to a number of transactions that we may not have necessarily been involved in the detail planning, but as we're going through the bank financing, we can see them in absolute detail. It gives us an interesting advantage, and I love getting on the phone and and uh, or on these Zoom calls and collaborating with the different partnerships and brainstorming ideas. You know, you walk away really energized and you know creating some solutions that are fun to then use as a tool going forward. So we love to bring in those teams and and love to collaborate. Fantastic. Well, Dave Hinkamp, Aaron Hassler, has been fantastic, as you say, Aaron, getting together seeing each other face to face here over the screens. And I am looking forward to seeing the two of you sometime live in the next six months or so. We'll be like hanging out, enjoying beverages, maybe recording another one of these things. So thank the both of you for joining us today on the Advisor Financing Forum. Wonderful to have you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mike. We appreciate the opportunity. And uh, as you know, it's always much warmer up here in uh, Minnesota than it is in Texas. So come up anytime. <laughs> That's right. I'll would love to out. see you as a three-dimensional person. That's right. Exactly. Yeah, I yeah. promise you, I'm not just on a screen. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you, Jens. I appreciate it. Have a good one. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you very much for listening to or watching this episode of the Advisor Financing Forum podcast. It's always a pleasure to have you with us. I hope you found the show informative and actionable, but not panic actionable. Remember, a measured, well thought out approach is always best when it comes to selling or buying an RAA business. Make sure you subscribe to the show on your favorite podcast platform or YouTube if you haven't done so already. We are working on a lot of great content and you're not going to want to miss any of it. Huge thanks to Dave Hinnenkamp for joining us as well. I absolutely loved Dave's style. He really has a way of making it easy to understand complex topics while delivering guidance with a bit of a chill vibe. You just feel like you're in good hands with Dave. So uh, check them out at bergenkdv.com when you have a moment. And before I let you go, make sure you swing by skyview.com to learn more about your options for financing to facilitate your plans for buying or selling an RIA or independent advisory firm. The Skyview team is always there to help. Lastly, 
Welcome to the home stretch of the pandemic. When you get your chance, take your shot. We are so close to opening the world back up again and seeing each other in person. I can't wait to be in person with the Skyview team recording one of these shows across the table from each other. It's going to be amazing. And maybe we'll put together some sort of live event and you can come join us. That would be awesome too. All right. In the meantime, keep listening and watching the show. We will see you next time on the Advisor Financing Forum podcast. See ya. Bye.